All right, this has been uh, recorded. Welcome to the building uh, community session for PulpCon 2020. Today is Tuesday, September 15th. I'm going to start the YouTube stream. And I believe that this is working. Yes, this is working. Uh, yes, this is working. OK, great. Um, all right, well, uh, one thing I love, one thing I really like about PulpCon um, this year, and maybe it was like this previous years, but everyone takes a different session um, in terms of leading and organizing it, which really I think spreads it around and makes it great. And so this this one happens to be mine. Uh, today, um, I am not the community manager, uh, which I'm thankful to say. Melanie is our community manager. You want to say hi, Melanie? Hi, everyone. Okay, that's good. That puts you on the screen, but. Um, so uh, what we were thinking about um, doing this year was kind of splitting our community session topics into two sessions. And so I'm just going to help organize the first one, and Melanie's organizing the second one. And um, part of the idea uh, was to have an outside speaker come and talk with us. Um, we had, I will get that URL here for you in a moment. Um, we had. Uh, here it is. Um, we were unable to have um, some of the folks uh, that we had wanted to come join us due to some conflicts. So um, today we're gonna, I'm gonna be kind of retelling some of the things that I had heard and using that as kind of a platform for discussion. Um, the goal I think of today's, uh, what I had really hoped for, but it's kind of, we can get out of it what we all want really. Um, is to explore this prompt, which is what's the best way for Pulp to grow its community? And I want to think about things that we've done in the past a little bit, and some of the discussion prompts help us with that, and then think a little bit about what um, what we think might work well for the future based on kind of where we're at in Pulp in the Pulp project history. Uh, the idea, I think, is today to focus on very much a brainstorming idea um, focus with a focus on uh, the what. Um, what do we think are the strategies that uh, will help grow the pulp community um, in, in a very successful way? And then tomorrow's, I think your session is tomorrow, Melanie, is that right? Yep, second session tomorrow, Brian. Great, second session tomorrow. Um, we're gonna really focus on kind of more of a plan, I think, and uh, how do we accomplish these kinds of things? So. Today we'll pick a direction, maybe, and tomorrow we'll figure out how we're going to put that to practice. Um, so uh, I had really wanted um, Greg Konisberg to come and join us for this session. Um, Greg has been talking to me for, uh, I don't know, I guess at least 12 months now, probably 18 or 24 at this point. Um, and one of the things that, he's, that he has reiterated to me over and over again, which unfortunately I'll have to just proxy since he's not here to tell you himself, um, is that uh, his take on the pulp community's growth and trajectory is to really focus on our user growth, um, to focus on growing the number of users and the different kinds of users, but really just numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, and uh, this is a, he called this out um, as a contrast to the strategy that we had taken in previous years. Um, not that it was you know, necessarily a bad strategy, but he was advocating for a different one. Um, the previous strategy, I think, was to have a focus on attracting contributors. Um, if we think about what Pulp 3 was really about, um, there was a strong focus on an emphasis on plugin writers, like kind of first and foremost. And we really tried to get the API right and the feature set right for users, but uh, the focus on con attracting contributors was a main focus. So. Um, the what I had heard from Greg was was just that. Um, so uh, with that, I just have some starter discussion questions, and my hope is that we can kind of bring ideas from all over um, and hear from a lot of people about uh, what they would like to, uh, what they think they what what we think we would like to uh, see in terms of you know what's the trajectory and what's the the some of the goals for uh, growing the pulp community and is a real focus on users 
and user growth, you know, the right model, or is there a different model that we should consider? That's that's certainly um, fair as well. So uh, just to get us started here, the first question I came up with was, maybe these are controversial, I don't know, but um, was uh, recently we accepted co-maintenance responsibility for Pulp Cookbook. So um, I picked this as the first question because um, Pulp Cookbook was is a plugin that manages Chef Cookbooks. Um, this was created by Simon um, Bates. Uh, forgive me, Simon, later if you're watching this and I don't say your name correctly. Um, I don't believe Simon's here right now. But um, we accepted co-maintenance responsibility of this because Simon wanted uh, more, uh, he wanted it updated and he just did not at this moment in time have enough uh, time to keep it up to date. And so the plugin had st stopped receiving updates and it was no longer compatible with newer versions of Pulp Core. So it was basically unusable, um, although it had a really great feature set. So um, I asked this one because, uh, you know, was this the right decision? What are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on accepting uh, on uh, the Pulp team overall um, accepting co-maintenance responsibility for this plugin that we did not develop initially. I guess the first question off, I is, go ahead. I think we need to define what that means because not everyone is clear on like, what does that mean, co-maintenance of a plugin? Yep, and so um, the discussion that I had with Simon about this is that um, Whenever we make some sort of backwards incompatible changes in the plugin API, where uh, a specific change needs to be made in all the plugins, uh, we would help uh, make that change in uh, the cookbook plugin. It's not necessarily uh, addressing uh, bugs that are specific to the feature set of that plugin or of adding new features. Um, the goal is to just uh, keep it compatible with any sort of backwards and compatible changes um, in Pulp Core, which I'm hoping there will be fewer and fewer of those as we go along. Uh, so that's the plan with the Comey. So when we accepted that responsibility, was that when we moved it into our org or was it already in our org beforehand? It, yeah, no, exactly. We moved it into our org so that uh, Pulp developers, Red Hat employees basically uh, could make those changes without Simon having to uh, you know, approve the PR because we had a PR that was open for uh, a couple of weeks and he was, uh, not able to get back to it uh, in a timely fashion. And so that got merged. And now since then, he's uh, actually improved the documentation on it. Um, and he's continuing to give attention to it, but he can only do it in small uh, uh, bursts of time. So it feels to me that that, that decision is a is a continuance of the how do we get more developers to work on pulp because we're reaching out to the developer involved and you know smoothing the path if you will for them well the the way i looked at it was i want uh, users to be able to use the cookbook plugin and if it's not compatible with the latest version of pulp core it's not a plugin that's available and so it it's definitely uh, geared toward attracting more users and keeping more users. So I think if it's in our org and we can't really commit to fixing like particular bugs that are uh, like specific to the cookbook plugin, um, then that might present a bit of a uh, confusion on the part of the users um, that we might want to address. Uh, maybe that just means that in the readme we say, or the, the description of the repo, we say, this is a community maintained plugin um, in our org for visibility and convenience. 
Um, yeah, I don't know that we need to do any sort of labeling like that. Um, I'm hoping that we actually do get bug reports and this becomes a problem. And until we have a problem on our hands that, you know, we're not able to maintain this plugin actually, I don't think we need to put any sort of labels on it. Um, and I told Simon that I'm hoping that uh, once we do have a community reaching out to us for, you know, issues, that we can start soliciting contributions from the community also. Um, because right now, I don't even know if people are actually using this plugin. Uh, and so I don't actually have any concerns with us maintaining it because there is no maintenance burden except for running the plugin template on it from time to time to update the CI and, you know, release it with the most compatible, uh, with the latest pulp core compatibility. Okay. Can can we take a um, can we go into like a little sub question here, Daniel? Sure. I, th I think I think what you're asking about is very interesting, um, and I want to maybe can we take a minute to explore some various perspectives on what what it is, what is it that we're offer that being in our org is really offering to our users um, with with and just to make it specific, um, what expectation is there to users of Pulp software around particular bugs being fixed? Um, Maybe some. Maybe if anyone can share, what are your what are your thoughts on? Um, well, so I think it's all them. open source, and uh, <laughs> the bugs can be fixed by anyone. And so I don't think I don't think it's just the people's uh, responsibility here to fix bugs. I think it's our community as a whole responsibility to fix bugs. It's just uh, we fix highest priority bugs, you know, ones that we every day uh, decide are important to us, even on the individual level. We pick what work we want to do. Um, and if there are issues that are open for a long time and nobody finds that they're important enough to fix, they don't get fixed. And I suspect that if there is a really important bug that needs to get fixed, it will get fixed. All right, appreciate that. What are some other perspectives on what this means? Should I just wonder, should we define this somewhere? Because it's all personal expectations and without some kind of framework for how we approach prioritizing work and how much we would accept contributions without finding that somewhere it's all based on assumption or if we were having issues where, for example, I know OSPO will look at the they will make a judgment on the quality of the project, like the open source project, based on how many bugs are left open and for how long. They'll make some kind of comment around that, at least. It'll, they'll take it as some, to mean something. So we have regular bug triage that we advertise, and you're pretty good at doing this. But when it comes to community contributions, and I suppose that's the whole thing, again, we're talking about contributions rather than than users in this but should we as an action item define our level of involvement on on this that's just what i would think and i think that's what we're that's what we're groping for yeah brian is that is that kind of what you're it feels to me that's part of what this discussion right now is trying to define is what does it mean for a plugin to be in the pulp org as opposed to not in the pulp org, and whether there's any expectations. Um, well, I, I mean, my my actual um, the, the where this question came from was I felt like it was a particularly poignant question in exploring the contrasting approach between 
um, a strategy that's designed to attract developers versus a strategy mm -hmm. that's designed to attract contributors, uh, to yeah. attract users. Because, um, and actually less about defining it, although to your point, Melanie, um, having a, setting clear expectations with our users, I think is, is a good thing to do. So I'm very, I'm very much in favor of that. Um, the challenge I think comes in that um, there, there isn't, uh, there is a free software use relationship, but there is not actually a financial relationship between um, users of free software and the developers who make it in a direct way. And so it's difficult to to set a clear um, level of service there. And so I'm hesitant to try to do so. Um, I think the lines are a lot more clear if there's a, um, a paid product that is built on top of open source software that, um, and I think it's great by the way that we have at least two companies on this call um, represented that that make pay for products on top of it. Um, so I'm a little hesitant to try to codify such a such a level of service offering because one, I think it's really difficult. But but despite my hesitancy there, I think exploring what we feel that level of commitment is and what what we strive to do. What does it mean to do this well? I think that's a worthy question of answering whether we can write it down in, in bullets or not. How much effort was it for that uh, user to put their plugin into the org? Um, the that user transferred it to me, and then I transferred it to the org. Um, At time time wise, un, under under an hour. Um, because if I think of myself as a passive contributor to certain projects. I don't give a rat's ass about your standards or structure, right? I am doing you a favor because I'm doing a passive contribution to your project. And so if you're looking at something like that, it's what did you do to make my life easier? Because I don't care about your standards. Yeah, it took me an hour and you said you would help me keep mine up to date so my stuff worked. That's probably a fair trade. Well, the transferring, yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. And just to, I think, um, even further bolster your point here, um, if we actually look at investment levels on both sides with regards to this plugin, um, I think Simon, and I'm totally guessing here, but just in collaborating with him on various parts, um, he's got to have a minimum of at least 40 probably 80 to 120 hours in this plugin. So he's, um, more than a passive, he's more than a passive contributor in this case. Oh, yeah. And not Absolutely. Only he's a creator of plugin, it. Well, okay. not only did he create the plugin, but while he was creating the plugin, he influenced the design of Pulp Core. <laughs> he okay. was okay. So actually, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's definitely more than passive. But I, actually, I think your, I think your point is, still very well made, um, which is what I heard in it at least, which is that, um, you know, the the equity in this, in this deal um, is pretty sound in the sense that for our couple of hours here and there to keep it up to date along with breaking changes is, um, is small enough that it's worth it to make sure that our users can benefit from its feature set and his equity in the deal is that he allows us to co-maintain it, even though it really is his um, from a time perspective, uh, so that it stays up to date with less effort. And I think that's a good trade all around generally. But if our strategy is to attract contributors, attract contributors, then when we step over that line, it could be perceived as a misstep. And that's actually why I picked this question to start with. So are we still talking about attracting contributors as the main thing we want to concentrate on in building community? Well, the my hope for this session is actually that we can make a poignant um, reflection, perhaps shift towards a uh, attracting users as the main focus. Because this is uh, this has some some callbacks to the discussions we had with Neil yesterday on basically if you're already excited about pulp 
then it's easy to find things because you're Googling for it and you find them there. And Melanie's done a lot of work to, to you know, have things show up appropriately. And um, if you're already writing a plug and you understand things. If I don't know about pulp, I, I, I want to be an actual user. I am never going to contribute to PR, although I'll probably contribute bugs when things go wrong. But I have a problem I have to solve. What I need as that level of user is is the the a well advertised kind of sexy looking elevator pitch what is this thing and then once i'm like i think that might solve my problem a bunch of like cookbooks i want to be able to here's a here is a common thing that people want to do with pulp here's the exact steps you need to follow to make that happen here's how to use it for rpm here's how to use it for containers uh you know the the, the wizard workflow kind of stuff um because we at that what we're really to, to get users who don't already know about Pulp to use it, we have to advertise it like any other product and tell people, hey, you've got a problem and I bet we can solve it and here's how easy it is. And as soon yeah, as you get to a point where it's not easy, like if you say, oh, you got, here's a workflow that 20,000 people across the world can need to have solved and we can solve it for you. And here's the instruction page that has the 87 manual steps it's going to take. We're done. But if it was a, here's the- We're done meaning? The, 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 a, a user who doesn't already know about Pulp is going to look at that and go, I don't have time for that and just move on, right? The, the more, the less friction there is between the, the moment of what is this, what, what is this thing? to, wow, I have it up and running on a test machine and I can see it actually working and helping me. The less friction there is in that path, the, the easier it is to start building your, your yeah. user community, not your contributor community, but your users. Because the users, go ahead. What's that time? What's your time window? From, from I found it to it's running. And if it's not running by that time, I'm, I'm walking away. What's your time? That's an a really, no. That's a really good question. I suspect an hour. For, let's be fair. This isn't a video game. You know, it's not a. It's not a an email client. This you're not even going to be looking for this unless you're you're used to having to solve pretty hard problems and working in the sysadmin world. Um, less than a day, certainly. I should be able to get a feel for exactly what the product is and what it can do for me and what the, the steps are for various common use cases in that hour, I would think, Brian. And I should be able, you know, the, the first hour is, I'm excited about this because it talks about a problem that I actually have and it looks like it's an easy answer. And then if I can have an instance up and running somewhere in less than a day, then that makes me excited to use it. If it's if there's an instance out there that I can look at, and that we can't do this right now, but let's say we had a, a a web UI that looked really nice, and there was just an instance running out on the on the public web, and with our we had our back turned on, so you could look at things, but you couldn't change things. That also helps you get past that first hour because it lets people get excited about it. And the the problem that I see us having is we're really good at. And we will, we are, we are, my, my observation, my jaundiced opinion is we are really good at working with our contributors and, you know, the contributors that, that we work with in IRC, I've even seen a number of folk call out, you know, you guys are one of the easiest projects to work with. You were very receptive and, you know, you, you were excited about my bug report and I think we're doing a pretty good job there, but those are the people that already know about pulp and it's a, it's a 99-1 kind of problem in, in any given community. 90% of your of your of the people that touch the community are gonna you're gonna hear nothing from them. They're totally silent. You don't even know they're there. Nine percent of them are going to occasionally contact you, probably with in our case a bug, maybe a PR. One percent of your community are gonna be active and engaged. And that is that's you know, the people who only open bugs but do it regularly are part of that one percent. The contributors are even lower. And it, to get pulp, um, uh, the pulp community larger to where people, because I and I think we should, because pulp has a thing to offer, right? There's this is a hard problem to solve that a lot of people are solving in a lot of really bad ways. Um, we have to figure out how to make that ninety percent reachable. And right now we're yeah, reaching so, one to three percent, right? Yeah. So um, I I believe if if Greg uh, Deconersberg could have been here, one of the things he's told me before was the reason to focus on 
user growth is a strategy to ultimately attract contributors. And this yeah. is a little bit, I think, of what I'm hearing from you. He said that if you have a large enough uh, user base, folks will naturally contribute either as heavy bug reporters, yep. um, early release testers, or actual code contributors themselves. Um, what are uh, what do some other folks think on this call? Um, and then I, after that, I want to maybe jump down to question 16 if there isn't other perspectives. But what are some other thoughts about this from some other folks? So I wanted to just call back to the reason why we were focusing on contributors before was that Pulp was not GA. Um, and so to spend a large amount of effort trying to attract users at that point would just be to invite them getting annoyed or frustrated when the API is still changing and that we're still getting feedback. People are writing plugins and deciding that things need to change um, because they don't quite work with the plugin API. Um, and so I think now that Pulp is GA, Pulp Core is GA, um, I think the, the benefit to all of us here in attracting users is to get that feedback, get these plugins that have been written, the API is, is solid now, um, and to get those bug reports and kind of get Pulp 3, you know, hardened basically of a lot of people using it. So um, I just, I just want to call that out because I think the, the strategy before was the correct one for where we were. Um, and now at this point, we're looking at um, you know, we have multiple companies that are trying to productize on top of Pulp, um, and uh, we want to make sure that those production use cases are ready to go. And I think, you know, we have a lot of people within the community also that have been waiting and wanting to, to you know, get that signal that things are ready to go so that they can move to it in, in production in their companies or their universities or wherever their use cases are. So. Um, just wanted to call that out as kind of the larger context in which we're making that switch. It's not, um, yeah, just, yeah. Why, why are we looking for those users and why is this the right time to do that? That's an excellent point, Robin. Um, yep, thank you. What are some other thoughts about, the, about these um, maybe from some folks we haven't heard from? I've been reading an article uh, where it was saying that um, projects projects which have uh, mid to large uh, community they usually have big user base, which brings them uh, as a side effect a lot of contributions. For projects which have reasonably small community, they should focus on extending the user base and not the not to have the focus on the contributors because basically we the bigger user base you have the bigger chance you have of the contributions and not vice versa first you need to focus on the image advertisement and, and raise the um, awareness of the project and usually this comes with people using projects and getting hooked up on it I just want to say in the past, I think I think, I think we uh, focused on contributors a lot because we didn't have many plugins and we only had like a handful. I feel like now we have like what, 10 plugins or something like that. So I feel like we have a good set of plugins. And so I think it makes sense to focus on users and maybe some of the user features like UI and stuff like that would make sense at this point. Sounds like we're trans transitioning to that question on line 16. Exactly, Dennis. Yeah. Daniel, um, I, well, I guess I, I probably shouldn't call anyone out in particular, but I, I was interested in what you were talking about earlier, and I didn't know if you got a chance to share what you were thinking. Um, what in particular? In particular, um, it maybe we should be doing more for an emphasis on bug fixes, um, or maybe we should be having clearer expectations. Uh, with our users. Well, um, so I, I guess what I meant, I didn't really mean like any particular bug, but more in general, like what what date the the uh, agreement, I guess that um, or not agreement, but uh, you know, if we're just keeping keeping the plugin in line with uh, Pulpcore mostly, like 
if that's 90% of what we're doing, um, then I don't know. Um, yeah, where, where, where does that, you know, what service are we really doing for our users? Yes, they have an up-to-date plugin that has um, known issues and no plan to fix them, perhaps, just to paraphrase what I'm hearing. I mean, that's one of the so, dangers of, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Um, so I was going to say, um, I can't see everybody on the call. There's a lot more people, though. Um, any any other thoughts on on this uh, on this these contrasting strategies before we go on to question line on line sixteen, for example? Um, I don't have anything new to add. I think uh, everyone is more or less in agreement. Um, that it's a, it's a good idea at, at this point to switch to user-oriented uh, strategy. Great, great. I'm loving the hats. Um, <laughs> Brian, to see more people, you can adjust the layout. Like, uh, I have 15 people on my screen at the moment. All right, well, maybe someone in chat can tell me how to do that. Oh, I can figure it out. Oh, I'll play with it. I see the layout button. All right. Um, so then, why don't why don't we ask this? So, where's our bet? Um, well, two two things. Uh, tomorrow's session. I hope that we can talk a lot about how, like, what are the twenty things that we can do to attract more users. Um, so I want to try to save a lot of the let's do this, let's do that for tomorrow. Um, from a high, <laughs> from a high level, though, uh, let's. Have, I want to look at the question at line sixteen. So, what is more important at this time in our history in terms of our effort? Um, is it more plugins or is it better plugins? Uh, are is it more usable things around plugins and? I list examples like a UI, a CLI, being able to deploy in different environments, like with operators and things like that. Um, where do we where do we think our effort is best spent? That's the that's the question I'd like to ask for our remaining time. Well, with what Grant said earlier, um, I think we should definitely focus on usability and making things just easier to do. I think so far we've uh, made it easier to um, install and deploy. I feel like we've got that process uh, pretty smooth. However, uh, the fact that you have to, you can only use the REST API or, you know, use a Python or um, Ruby client to do all of the interaction is still a barrier to a lot of people. Um, so a CLI or a UI where we are very prescriptive, the REST API is very good because it gives you a tool bag that lets you do very many things, but it also requires you to take many steps to do that. Um, a CLI or a UI that has uh, very prescriptive workflows that can be executed in fewer steps uh, would help users uh, in that first hour of getting to know Pulp uh, to really go through all the possible workflows. Yeah, I agree. I would also like to echo something I heard uh, earlier this week uh, during our Pulp PulpCon, that users like our project and they have big plans to use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, uh, they are um, they cannot keep up with all the changes we're making and they are not 100% sure is it safe to install and use it in production. Having that said, I think we should focus more on usability and stability of plugins. Basically not quantity, but quality. The way I've heard what Dennis described, uh, described in past lives is you want common things to be easy and uncommon or hard things to be possible. And 
in a lot like there's lots of examples out there where common things are easy and you can't do the hard things. Um, IBM has traditionally had a history of common things are hard and hard things are still hard. <laughs> Everything's equally hard. Um, and I think where we are with pulp is there's an amazing number of things you can do with a certain amount of work, but you have to do the same amount of work, whether it's an, it's a common thing that everybody wants to do, or it's a really weird thing that only one user wants to do. The, the kinds of effort, the amount of effort you have to go through is very similar. So if we could get to that point where the common workflows are easy, that gets you 80% of the people that want to use your product. He says, making up numbers off the top of his head. I like your numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I the other thing which I would say is, you know, if I'm, how do you go, how do you go out and look for other projects? Right. So I have a pointy head when I don't have the uh, antlers. Um, but I tend to look for examples of people that have used it in the situation that I want to do. So if CI CD is important, you need a running example of CI CD. Don't just talk about here's how to create a, an RPM repo. Because really, there's like eight people in the world that care about RPMs outside of the RHEL ecosystem. So you need to have example. For me to find it, you would need to have examples of the problems I'm trying to solve. So CICD is one. I don't know what the other ones are. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a big one. We definitely uh, have the single container that we've now provided, which uh, is now being used in CI pipelines for multiple projects and outside of Red Hat. Um, and we've had contributions from users to improve that container because uh, it, it's so useful to them. And I have been so trying the, to solicit blog posts about yeah. how their use cases and like how they're using it because those users can best describe it. Like I, I understand it in theory, but I don't have a good concrete example that would tell a um, believable story, you know, where I'm talking from my own experience. It's marketing. It doesn't have to be believable. <laughs> Come on. Wait, is this recorded? Shit. <laughs> but to be fair, you don't have to be the subject matter expert, right? You can be pointing at other people's, but to, I agree with you that having the person who did it involved would be better. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I've got, a, I've got a, a session coming up this morning, um, which is aimed at if you're using pulp, what are you using it for? Partially to try and pull out those stories that we don't think about because we tend to think about how do you code pulp to make it do whatever it does more efficiently. Um, but not, I don't, at least I do not think about it in the context of what's a real world workflow that's keeping my company alive where pulp is just the tool that I'm using. And that's really what we're one of the things we're going to try and get out. Um, I definitely want to continue this conversation in that one as well. Yes. Yeah, so um, speaking of continuing conversations tomorrow, I think we can, um, like I said earlier, have a, a pretty big brainstorming session about how, um, you know, how do we want to try to tackle this problem and tackle this shift in focus? Um, what I was wanting to ask now is, um, oh, good, Kieran, you're on the call again. Um, I was hoping to take a few minutes, uh, and since we're talking about community and maybe shift our conversation just a minute, um, we only have five minutes left. Uh, can we get some, uh, solicit some input from folks that are outside of um, Red Hat just to be plain about it? Um, and I, Kieran, this, you're, you're one of these folks, and um, Douglas, uh, I don't know you personally, but um, it says that you are also from outside of Red Hat. Um, if you're have something to share that you feel like in terms of building community and what um, the pulp community can do, which you guys are part of, to build. Um, what would you say? What would you say? What What do we need to do to make this really um, effective? Uh, I'm not the best person to answer those sorts of questions. I'm quite antisocial. Um, <laughs> I hop onto IRC when when I need to to ask some questions for for reference. I'm I'm Wibbit. On IRC, some of you uh, know me um, hopping on and yes. off. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Man, nice to meet you. 
<laughs> nice to meet you all too. Um, so when it when it comes to communities, I'm 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 not the the best person to ask. Um, two young children and a full time job. I'm fairly maxed out. But what was your journey, uh, Douglas, to finding pulp? How did you arrive at talking to these people? Because that's, I think, what would help them yeah, sure. find other people like you. Uh, so, I mean, my background is um, for the last 15 years has been enterprise um, environments. Um, the last company I was working at, an engineer happened to mention pulp. We adopted Satellite 6, um, cried quite a bit. Um, I moved on to another organization um, that was heavily SLES based, um, tried setting up pulp to work on SLES. Uh, thankfully, we uh, managed to convince the powers that be to migrate to REL. Um, it, so it was, I mean, to answer the direct question, it was another engineer that mentioned it um, 10 years or so ago. Um, my first experiences were through satellite. My second experience was um, writing against Pulp2 API to manage our entire release process um, for 2,000 odd computers, um, extensively using RPM. Um, don't really make much use of any of the other plugins in Pulp2. I'm currently rewriting everything for Pulp 3 um, and looking to use file and container as well as Pulp and possibly Debian and PyPy plugins. So it'd be a far larger adoption. What is the reason of you changing your mind and using more of our plugins? Is it like better readability and usability? <clears throat> Uh, we had we had immediate requirements, which was RPM, um, and we just didn't have throughput to adopt any of the other ones. Um, that that's the main reason. Uh, it, there's always a reason to use it. It's just as to whether you can justify the time to write the tooling um, to make use of it. Well said. Um, I think one comment I would make with regards to the CLI stuff is, um, yes, it's it's very useful for that first hour for people to experiment and, and get a feeling for it. Um, but certainly from my perspective, it's very heavily based on what my company already does. Um, and for that, we need to be able to leverage the API to get it to work within the organization. We could never have adopted satellite, for example, because it was simply too restricted. Um, the company has 15 years worth of release mechanisms and methodology that we need to fit in with. And using a CLI just, just wouldn't allow you to do that. Um, the only way of doing it is with a flexible API. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and it is a joy to see you on the call after all this collaboration. That's so fun. <laughs> Um, we, we are almost out of time. Um, I would love for anyone to come back to our session tomorrow, but just before we go, Kieran, do you have any, um, particular advice that you'd like to share or an outsider's perspective, please? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I will mention it in my upcoming talk as well. Uh, but I think my experience has been, or the most difficult thing for somebody sort of who's on the outside, quote unquote, or uh, in the community, but not in the pod team and not from Red Hat sitting in on every meeting and so on and so on is just pace and churn. So like there's just, and I mean, a lot of that is probably just the pub two to pub three rewrite, right? So my expectation is that some of the churn and pace will slow down and stabilize and that will help a lot. <laughs> like, because it's, it's just, well, I'm not going to be working on pub full time. So if the pace is incredibly fast and the next time I look, uh, my development environment no longer works and uh, there's a new pulp core version I need to update to and, 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 then it can be tough sometimes. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it again in, in my talk because it's, uh, yeah, have it in there. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, that's great. Uh, all right, well, that does take us um, a minute over our time. Uh, 
I want to thank everyone for joining. And tomorrow's, uh, let's take a look at the schedule here. Um, well, you can see the schedule. Um, here's the link uh, to the schedule, just so it's easy for so you can see the rest of today's sessions. We'll be reconvening on the same bridge here in uh, nine minutes for our next session. So we'll just get a break. Um, tomorrow's uh, community session, which Melanie is going to run, is the second session. And there we'll explore the how we can build uh, more uh, users. And Kieran, to your point, um, bring uh, more stability, perhaps. Thank you all for joining. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to end the recording now. <laughs>